would love to get, uh, do it better. Uh, hi, everyone. And um, again, and um, good to see you all. And maybe you see this in the recording. Um, yeah, great to have uh, once again uh, Mehab Abele with us um, from the Center for Teaching and uh, Learning and Teaching at the American University in Cairo. I got that right. At least, yes. <laughs> and you are a professor of practice, right? And um, yes. a, a truly open educator and a researcher about open education. And yeah, it's a great honor uh, to have you with us uh, again. And thank you so much for contributing and providing us your view and an introduction to open educational practices and just being with us. Uh, it's always really appreciated. Uh, so thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming to spend part of your day with us today. Uh, there's a small enough group that I think if you want to interrupt me at any time, I mean, you can always interrupt me at any time, but you can really, really interrupt me at any time and like raise your hand as well, not just in the chat. But we'll have the chat working the whole time. We're together, inshallah. So I'm going to focus today on talking about uh, going towards openness that promotes social justice. A lot of times people talk about open education as if it will always result in social justice, and I don't think that happens if we don't have that intention. Um, but I always like to say, assalamu alaikum, because I don't know if it's morning or evening or afternoon for everybody. People are at different time zones, and assalamu alaikum is just peace, and it works for high and by and any time of day. And I also <laughs> always want to ask how you're feeling today. So let me know in the chat how you're feeling today. Or maybe the, the kitty with her mama cat uh, puts you in a better mood, I don't know. <laughs> Hi, Antonio. Nice to see you again. <laughs> Kath is joking. She's saying you're positive. <laughs> the time when being positive is not a good thing. <laughs> People energetic, relaxed, good. All right. Thank you all for sharing. I'm going to ask different questions as we go on today. Uh, but I also like to know where you all are joining us from. I'm intentionally using this map that's a little bit different than the one that we usually look at because the one we usually look at is actually quite distorted. This one's kind of more round. So if you know how to do this, um, I want to know where either where you're located or where your heart is because sometimes you're located somewhere but you're actually from somewhere else. So people usually when we join in chat, we say where we are and it doesn't really mean that you're from that country or from that uh, city. So if you ha if you can see at the top of your Zoom, it should say you're viewing Mahabeli's screen and you should be able to annotate either from up there or down at the bottom of your thing. And if you're on a computer rather than um, a, like a tablet, you should be able to like, I'll pick a heart and tell you that I'm here in Cairo, can, in Egypt. Can you see that? And I was also born in Kuwait, so I'm going to put that here as well. I didn't end up putting stars, I just put hearts. Can others, uh, are others able to do that? If you're not, you can just tell me in the chat where you are. It's totally fine. I'm also not very good with geography, so I might not even know where the, what that country is. <laughs> like a lot of the Northern European countries that are close to each other, I'm not always sure where, what that, which country it is. Okay. So everybody seems to be on, on a similar time zone to me. So it's like morning for everyone, right? And some people wrote in the chat. Small annotate pencil at the bottom left hand, yeah. I wasn't sure where it, where it goes now <laughs> because on the host, it looks different than I think when you're not a host or I'm not actually sure, so. <laughs> so many places you love, okay. All right, thank you. And I know that's Kath at the, in the South African part. Yeah. So if somebody's not on a laptop, the stamp doesn't work. Okay, thank you all so much for sharing where you are. Oh, there's somebody in Australia. Did I just see that? 
Is that a place you love or a place you where you are? I'm curious. And there's someone on the west coast of the U.S. Uh, no places I love. Uh... Places you love. Okay. <laughs> cool. All right. Thank you all so much for sharing that. I'm just going to delete it now so that we can just move on. But thank you for sharing. There might be another opportunity to use annotation today. So um, I think everybody is here when I share the slides, but I'll share them one more time. And you can comment on these slides after the session. Sometimes when we're talking, there's no time to say what you want, but you might want to come back later and, and talk about it. All right, so for today, I'm hoping to do these things, but if I find that you're more interested in taking it in a different direction, I'm happy to, uh, to, to do it slightly differently. Um, and there is an activity using paper towards the end if we have time. So I'll give you time to go get paper if you don't have any on hand. All right, so Cheddarfall, I'm going to ask you a few questions in the chat, and then I'm going to share a cupcake story. I always get really interesting stories to share in my presentations from my daughter. <laughs> I'm going to do an activity called TRIZ, and then we'll talk about model about infusing social justice throughout open educational practices. Um, there will be time to understand what open educational practices are. I don't know where everybody is on this, so I don't want to over-talk it if people already know what it is, but I don't want to ignore talking about it. And also, people mean different things by it. So, And I'll talk about how do we apply intentionally equitable hospitality, which is um, a, a way of being in the world that my colleagues and I have developed, and how do we apply it to design openness for social justice. The final activity in Spiral Journal is where we could use paper. If we have time, we'll do it. All right, so this question is for you all in the chat. What nourishes you lately? Asking that question during the, the lockdown period was so important because it also gave me lots of ideas of what people, different people do to, to help their well-being at a time where most of us weren't feeling great. So. so what nourishes you? Let me know in the chat. Mm. Helping colleagues with generative AI and ONL and taking a walk with your dog, planning for spring events, interaction with people, personal time, chocolate and coffee. <laughs> I just had a dates with chocolate just before starting, just to give myself a boost of energy. <laughs> I'm also quite energized by helping people and just interacting with people and planning for events where I think it's going to be helpful. All right, so a lot of us are energized by helping people, which kind of makes sense for being in the field of education, right? And uh, And especially if you're interested in open education. So this is a quote I really love which is that building community is to the collective as spiritual practice is to the individual. This is from Adrienne Marie Brown. And um, since a lot of you are into helping people, interacting with people, I'm, I'm thinking it'll probably resonate. It's almost a spiritual practice, right? Um, so uh, I kind of love this book called Emergent Strategy, and it's influenced me a lot. If you haven't had a chance to read it, it's really, really beautiful. And it draws upon biomimicry, so we sort of understand the world that we are living in through nature, right? Action feeds the soul. I like that. <laughs> and so I want to ask you about openness. And openness has different meanings in different societies. Jörg, have you talked about it at all yet, or is this the first interaction with it? This is really the first session, but we, I'm not sure how uh, our colleagues are, uh, and friends are familiar with the topic. Okay, so let me stop sharing and ask, who would consider themselves relatively familiar with what open education is and would be willing to share? And if not, I'm going to move on to just talking about the word openness before we talk about it in the field of education. So who feels like they know what open education is or they've worked in it already? Maybe I can tell what I've been experiencing in the university I'm working with and from out university. If it's okay, can I share? Go ahead, yeah. Yeah. So we were working on a few MOOCs, massive online open courses that are openly available for anyone who wants to 
to, to take them. I'm not sure if it falls into the category of it does. So MOOCs, so education, the so courses that people can take for free mostly. I mean, they could pay for a certificate, but it's generally free. That's one kind of openness for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for Maybe sharing. I can. Yes. Go ahead. Comment as well. Yes. Actually, the idea of open learning in terms of content and the process that it can happen was always discussed. And even uh, not only in content and process, but the assessment as well, uh, instead of just creating content, making knowledge, which is very much enabling towards sustainable development, that critical thinking, which can be achieved through that. Uh, beside, there were some discussions that I read about the meaning of transparency and openness and how they kick to each other in the concept. This is what I can just share. Thank you so much for sharing that, Badia. And yeah, and so like an assessment that, there's an expression, I'm sort of merging things that you said together to something that they call sustainable assessment. So they're, we're giving students an assessment to do. They can, it can be co-creation or any kind of assessment, but this assessment is shared openly with the world, maybe online, and it continues to be used. It's not something that the teacher takes and grades and it's in a closed uh, learning management system or virtual learning environment. It's actually shared and maybe in future years, other people continue to use it. Um, so it could be that students write their assignments on a blog and the blog keeps getting used or they co-create a book or something together or or they even uh, do a lot of their material on social media and it stays there or they even edit Wikipedia pages so that maybe the editing doesn't always stay because people edit all the time, but they've done something that is useful beyond the class, right? Uh, Juliana is talking about sharing is caring. Yeah, and it could be us sharing what we do as well, right? I'm going to provide some formal definitions, but I think even um, educators who just share, like with AI, for example, I think it's so important that nobody really knows what they're doing. And so sometimes it's useful to share early, even though I haven't found the answer yet, but to share my questions, to share how I'm thinking about something on social media, on my blog, something like that. And that's a kind of openness. And then other people who create with their students things about how they're doing AI in their class and they share that in an open space that other people can use. And some people share it in a way that other people can take it and adapt it and change it and reuse it in their own context. So it makes it easy for somebody else, not only to learn from us, but to take what we've done and reuse it in a way that's a bit easier for them. But I love the sharing is caring uh, aspect. And actually the quote that comes next is kind of related to that, also from Adrienne Marie Brown. So she's asking us about generosity. Are you, and let's ask ourselves this question, right? Are we actively practicing generosity and vulnerability in order to make the connection between us and others clear, open, available, and durable, related also to sustainability, right? So generosity in this sense means giving of what we have without strings or expectations. So when we share something, we're not giving it in order for someone to share something back. We're just giving it and giving it to the world and hoping someone will benefit from it, but not hoping to get paid for it. But the opposite of that is also important, this vulnerability of showing your needs, of when you need something, can, are you able to actually ask for help when you need it? Are you able to ask on Twitter or on LinkedIn or something, I'm looking for this thing and I don't know, I can't find resources on this thing or I can't solve this problem. There's the, there are Facebook groups where people, maybe smaller groups, but still relatively open and international. Uh, possibly ONL is a space where you can ask these kinds of questions in a safe space that sometimes in our own institution, if you ask that question, it can be a problem, but sharing it more openly can actually be more helpful. And I think that open education is, has this ethos, right, where it is interdependence. We, we know that we learn and benefit from others, and we can also benefit others. But the interdependence is not about the equality of offers in real time. It's not a give and take in the same moment. I can give for several years and then start taking, or I can be a student and I'm learning from others for a long time and then I'll start giving, or like the, I may be giving a different person than the person who's giving me. It's not about one-to-one. -one. Um, so Valeria already shared about MOOCs in her institution. Are others involved in any open projects, like projects where there's open education, like you're creating books that will be free to others or or things like that. No, all right. I'll share some exa some more examples as we go on. 
Um, and if you start to realize that you are working on one, but you're just not calling it that, we can talk about it. But first, I want to talk about the cupcake story. Um, so this is a story related to my child. <laughs> we were um, we were at a birthday party. And a lot of times these days, for some reason, we give cupcakes and birthdays instead of making a big cake. It's a little bit easier when you're outdoors to, instead of having to cut the cake and stuff. And someone told me that your daughter is saying that she made the cupcakes. And I was like, I didn't make the cupcakes. And she was like seven or something. She didn't make the cupcakes. What's going on here? So I asked my daughter and she said, the design, you know how you can print a design and put it on a cupcake now? He's like, that's my design. I designed it on my phone and I sent it to my friend and my best friend printed it on the cupcakes. Do you? Th how do you think my, my, my daughter felt about this? About having her designs on the cupcakes? I think different people would feel differently. So Susanna, what are you thinking? <laughs> you have like... <laughs> I think she must be proud. <laughs> I don't know mm -hmm. about uh, seeing her. Um, yeah. Her design being used. Her designs, yes, being used. Yeah. Like so a lot of people think she's going to be proud because the design's being used. She was actually upset because her friend didn't take her permission and didn't acknowledge oh. that this was her design. So that's what she was upset. She didn't mind that they were being used. Of course, mm -hmm. she's happy that they're being used. And that's why she's saying, I did them. Because mm -hmm. she wants people to know this is my design. So that is such an important part for her. And when we think about, yeah, so Kat's saying annoyed because people were chomping their teeth into her work. <laughs> she, well, I don't think she was annoyed about the chomping part. Was, <laughs> she was just annoyed for not having the credits for having designed them. Um, and that her friend, for some reason, wouldn't acknowledge that. I'm not really sure why. They were kids. But it, it really upset her, you know. Um, and it's one of those things. We we talk a lot about uh, copyright. I'm sure everywhere in the world people talk about copyright, right? Um, versus openness, where openness is almost the opposite of copyright. It's about allowing people to use your things without paying you, right? And to change your things sometimes, even without paying you. There are different licenses that allow people to modify and that allows for example for translation like you don't have to go back to the original author to translate that's one of the open licenses there are open licenses that allow you to share the work but ask people not to make commercial gain out of it so you can use my work for free but don't sell my work so don't take my open openly shared article and then sell it and put it in a book that you're selling for money for example um, so there's all of that but when we talk about this we're talking about laws and finance and I think we're missing out on the emotional aspect of like how my daughter was feeling about this. And I think there's this emotional aspect, you know, we need to know how the creator feels and intends for their work to be used or reused. And this is sometimes it's written explicitly and sometimes it's not, but how people feel is also important to me, I think, not just uh, the, the licenses. So Catherine Cronin um, is one of the open educators who talks about openness. And she did her PhD about open education. I don't know if any of you know her. I'm betting Kath probably knows her. Um, she talks about openness being contextual, personal, and continually negotiated. So even though there are laws about what is open and what is not, there are licenses, but it actually depends on your context of how you feel personally. And in your context, it's okay to share something openly or not. And continually negotiated means maybe today I feel comfortable with something, but maybe tomorrow I'm going to feel differently. And it's okay to keep changing this. It's not, doesn't have to be something that's fixed. So there is an Egyptian educator and author um, called Taha Hussein, who says, which means knowledge is like water and air. And he used to be also, um, so he was mainly an author, but he was also the minister of education at some point. So I want to know in what ways is education, so you can forget the open if you like, but in what ways is education like water or should be like water? Let me know in the chat or you can also unmute and share if you want. Free flow of thoughts. Yeah, I like that, Anthony. Thanks for sharing. What do others think?
flexible, provides opportunity. Yeah, because water will change its shape depending on what you put it in, right? It's, it's flexible that way. Can bring life to a situation. It's dynamic. I love that, Kath. Susanna, the immensity of knowledge. And I guess that particular gif is like the water is coming into your face. So it kind of has that element of overwhelm. Uh, June, yes, everyone should have enough of it. So everyone needs a little bit of it at least. And we can, if somebody doesn't have enough of it, again, we go back to the element of life. It can fit in a very small path to fill the lake. I like that a lot. So even if it seems like there's not much room for it, it can, it can do something can make a lake in a very small place. I like that a lot. It can change state from liquid to solid to gas. Uh, so education first phase online hybrid. Oh, that's so interesting. I love that. The online is the gas, <laughs> I'm guessing. Face-to-face <laughs> -face is the solid. <laughs> I like this, that's really nice. Ah, Jörg, you should not waste it or poison it. I love that a lot. I want to go back to this can change state and this ability to change from one thing to another and thinking about open education as a, when we share something with others, we're not just sharing what we do, but allowing them to change it as well. So it's like sharing with them a cup of water, and then they can take the cup of water and put it in a different cup or a different bottle to suit their context, right? And they can decide to drink it with a straw or do it in a different way or add flavor to it or lemons to it or sugar to it, right? And it's still our water that we gave them. So we still gave them something to start with, but then they can make a few changes to it. Or they can take some of the water and leave the rest because the rest isn't relevant to them. We definitely shouldn't waste or poison it, for sure. We should uh, protect it, right? And one of the ways, honestly, that I think about, and I'm going to skip this one. Um, one of the ways that we need to protect it that I think about a lot these days is like the way AI is just extracting data from everywhere without anybody's permission and without saying where it got anything from, right? Because it's putting everything together, but not um, not really keeping track of where everything's coming from. Um, so you get to see something, but you have no idea, like, is this one person's research? Is this like a hundred different people research this thing? Um, what's uh, How credible is this information? We have no idea. Um, so Suzanne Kosyoglu is a Turkish educator who lives in the UK. And she and I started talking about the self as an open resource. And this is attitude or worldview that's beyond the technical definitions of what openness is, like open access and open educational resources. But it's an attitude of a person and a way of looking at the world that is about sharing uh, what we do and being an open self who's editable, like we're willing to change ourselves, not just our materials, and narrating our practice, sharing our processes of how we're learning to do something, not just sharing the finished product. Sometimes it means making ourselves vulnerable and sharing incomplete thoughts or showing that we don't know something and asking questions. And this idea of negotiating knowledge in a public space sometimes can be uh, very powerful as well. And yeah, I'm just going to skip this part. But So this is another proper definition of open educational practices from Catherine Cronin. She's saying it's a broad descriptor of practices that include creation, use, and reuse of open educational resources, <coughs> and open pedagogies and open sharing of teaching practices. So the, the resources would be like a free book or a MOOC, whereas the open pedagogies are just ways we teach openly or where we teach our, uh, openly share our teaching. This is from Cheryl Hodgkin, Hodgkinson Williams in South Africa. I think a colleague of Kathy, Kath Fortune, but I'm not sure. Former colleague, maybe. Um, and Henry Trotter. And they were talking about the different parts of openness and open educational practice. So if we're going to create open materials, there's a lot of steps in it. There's individual or collaborative conceptualization. There's creation, curation circulation of this material, and all of these can be done with open pedagogies. Things loud, like crowdsourcing, with uh, which Antonio has been involved in. He's here today. <laughs> um, things like open peer review, where you can review articles in a way that's open, where the peer reviewer and the author know each other. Um, making things easy to locate, making it easy to copy and adapt materials and using. So when you share something, you don't share it as a PDF because people can't easily edit PDFs, but you can share it in another format that's easier to change. Um, 
They also talk a lot about social justice, but just not in this quote. For Robin DeRosa and Rajiv Jangani in North America, they're talking about the importance of caring about access and a commitment to learner-driven education. So putting students in the driver's seat of shaping public knowledge. So students themselves creating materials and sharing it rather than teachers and researchers doing that. And Sarah Lambert, who's based in Australia, talks about open education as the development of free, digitally enabled learning materials and experiences. And she adds something extra, which is doing them primarily and for the benefit and empowerment of non-privileged learners, people who may be underrepresented in education systems or marginalized in their global context. And a lot of times that also means involving them in the design of these materials rather than designing it for them or designing it about them. So one example of an open resource that I myself helped create is this one. I don't know if you've ever come across it before. So this was developed during the pandemic period. I'm an educational developer. So my main role is to support educators in my institution with teaching. Um, I don't know how many of you are in that space, uh, but I, I had already a lot of expertise in online learning. But when the pandemic happened, the remote learning period was not like online education beforehand because a lot of it was synchronous, whereas online education beforehand had a lot of asynchronous elements. And people weren't sure how to build community. And we said, you know, it's not, people don't know how to build communities. They don't have a lot of experience teaching online, but the period of social distancing and the physical distancing because of COVID was making it, everybody had high social needs. And so we thought it would be important for educators to know how to build community online. So Mia Zamora, Autumn Keynes and I got together with this organization called One Each E, and he said, we're, we want to develop this website and we're going to make it freely available because everybody who's supporting teachers is overloaded. All the teachers are overloaded. People don't have ideas. We have ideas. We'll share the ideas and we'll invite people from all over the world to share their ideas. And so we created this site and I'm going to open it very quickly. Um, and the adaptability of the activities is really important. So in the beginning, we were sharing activities like how do you introduce each other in the beginning of the semester? And then how do you warm up at the beginning of a class? And things like that. But if I go into warm-up activity and show you some of them, um, we would create a video of ourselves often doing the activity. So I'll just share this one because it always shows up first. Some of them have videos, some of them don't. But we model the activity for you so you can imagine how it's done. We're doing it from our living room. We're not doing it with like fancy lighting and fancy video, just because most of us were sitting in our living room doing the classes, right? And then we would also talk about where is it useful? How do you prepare for it? What kind of instructions? How long does it take? How can you adapt it? So think about adapting it when people, when you have someone with a disability. How do you adapt it if you don't have breakout rooms? How do you adapt it if you don't have Zoom at all? How could you do it necessarily? So here it has the adaptation, for example, for including alt text for images if you have someone who's visually impaired. So trying to think about all these things and giving resources so that someone who uses this doesn't have to use it the way we thought about it but to think about different ways. And a lot of times the people who helped create these resources were from all over the world. So that already brought a lot of perspective. So we had um, we have someone uh, from Australia, we have someone from Kenya, we had people from, a lot of people from Egypt, where I am, a lot of people from the US, but also like just from, these are all the people who contributed resources here. So even sometimes my own students contributed resources. So. It was just a very open collaboration where a lot of people would share these things. So you can't edit the videos very easily, but you have a lot of adaptations for how you could use this in your own classes. And it was meant to fulfill a need because not everybody had someone to support them with this in their own institution. So um, I want you to think about some of these things that I'm going to tell you are examples of openness and think about how do we make them orient towards more social justice. So I talked earlier about Wikipedia and editing Wikipedia. If you think about it, like Wikipedia is a very large open resource that anybody can edit, basically. Uh, in what ways is does Wikipedia or does editing Wikipedia promote social justice? Or how can we change the assignment so that it promotes social justice better? How might you do that? Then did anybody grow up in the time where there were like these huge encyclopedias? 
and there were like different papers and somebody would come and try to sell it to you. I don't know, were they expensive? I assume they were expensive, right? So does, does Wikipedia at least um, fulfill one social justice goal? What's that goal? <laughs> It's at least free, right? So already just by being free, Wikipedia is already promoting social justice. Everybody has access to a lot of knowledge. It's mostly credible for the most part because editors go back and check that important things are there. It might have incorrect information for a few days, but usually someone goes and checks. And if you go, sometimes you'll find a red article like saying this one doesn't have enough information or there aren't any sources. Like you have to provide a resource for every single thing you say. So it's relatively credible. Like they'd say it's, world book yeah <laughs> it's relatively accurate it's relatively up to date sometimes even more up to date than like britannica or whatever but are there any issues with wikipedia if we do an assignment where our students have to edit wikipedia how could we make it like uh, an assignment that promotes social justice even better What, what do you think of the idea in general of having students editing Wikipedia? Is that something that you think is a useful assignment at all? Suzanne, are you? Okay, Areti, hi, welcome. Hi, um, Samuel was a little bit late to join, but uh, I was in another meeting. And I had some technical issues. Um, You're welcome. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, like I am uh, late and I am also asking to, to speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, but Wikipedia and editing Wikipedia is, uh, is, is on my mind, has been on my mind for quite a long time. Um, what are the challenges? Um, I'm not very well uh, familiar with how uh, Wikipedia works, and uh, that is one of the things that keeps me from assigning it to my students. However, I mentioned it once in my class, and after a week, one of my students came up and uh, told me that he had, like, just by himself, edited um, a specific uh, category there. So uh, the question is here, uh, how do we know, how, how do we, how does this thing work? Of course it becomes mm -hmm. a factor, but, but how does it work to guarantee that there is quality in the content and that there, the, the, yeah, the, the, I can tell you that. I can share is, with you that. I don't know if this is the, the, the whole idea of the webinar, but one yeah. of my concerns is this, how do we check the validity of the information mm -hmm. is, and how to well, avoid bias, biased um, mm -hmm. perspectives. That's, Where are you based? I'm based in Greece, in the University of the Philippines. Okay. okay. And so I, there are Wikimedia volunteers everywhere in the world who you can actually invite to come and teach you and your students how to edit Wikipedia well. And they are usually, they usually have editor access and they can... Um, help you get going and learn about this. Wikipedia already has criteria for what is a biography of someone who's notable and how what's a good source to link to. Um, so they already have those quality standards and they're actually published. Like, I mean, if you look for them, you probably find those. So, um, th but there are usually people in your country who can do this. I don't know how you find them exactly, um, but usually if you can find like someone somewhere, they'll connect you to people other part in other parts of the world. Uh, if anybody here knows how you find them, I mean, I tend to find them. I go to open education conferences and somebody tells me, oh, you know who you have this person in Egypt and I'll give you their number. That's how I meet them. And then they give me each other's numbers and it like cascades that way. But there's definitely someone uh, there who, who already does this because if there's Wikipedia in Greek, there's probably someone who's managing the Greek version, right? So especially when it's a language that's not like from an, like other than English, you know, there's got to be someone in the country that, that does that. Um, Kath is talking about not all students having the required tools and digital literacy, even internet access. So, of course, if you can bring them to a lab in school to do it, bring mm -hmm. someone to teach them so that they're all at the same level. And actually, when you first create it, it used to be the case that when you first create an account, you can't edit. But if you've been editing for a while, you can. 
And someone can go in and delete what you wrote. So when you're talking about how do I make sure there's no bias and so on, there is bias in Wikipedia all the time. And that's sort of why, actually, there's more biographies of men than women, for example. In general, it's harder. Like there was someone, a woman who was a Nobel Peace, not, not Nobel Peace, Nobel, one of the science prize winners, and she didn't have a Wikipedia profile because she didn't meet the notability requirements because not enough people had written about her. And there need to, you need to have enough articles to know that this person is worth uh, writing about. So Jörg has been sharing some stuff in the chat. Jörg, uh, the Social Justice Wikipedia Editathon workshop. And so sometimes, and I don't know for this particular one, but people can look later. Sometimes the someone says, oh, this uh, culture or this kind of people are missing in Wikipedia. And that's why we're going to, we're going to, sit together and write about this thing because our culture is not represented or because women in this field are not represented and that's how they try to promote social justice on wikipedia itself so it's not just economic justice but also representation right um and then the second one that jörg said is something about having librarians contribute because librarians will always have good quality stuff to offer i think they're better at uh, finding sources uh, Jörg, do you want to say anything else out loud? I like what Juliana said about the kind of service learning approach, yeah, giving a service to the world. Right? I can just add, yeah, in your university libraries, check with them. They, they, they might be usually a, library, a Wikipedian in residence or someone interested in making and helping out in how to do this activities in, in your classes. So yeah. ask for help. And then I'm going to move to the next option I have, which is creating an open textbook. And I think as an educator, you can do one. You can collaborate with others to do one. You can also have your students do it. Um, but going back to Areti's point, if you have students do it, how do you make sure that the sources that they find aren't uh, the most biased ones? And then you have to do that work in the classroom, of teaching them how to find uh, good sources and how to check for bias. Sometimes... I tell people if they can speak more than one language to check the Wikipedia page in the different languages and they'll find that there's different stories about history depending on which language it's in. So Wikipedia is biased because the editors and people on it are biased. Um, I'm going to skip these two things and I want to talk about this. Um, are you all up for going to breakout rooms for a few minutes or not? <laughs> Generally like to go to breakout rooms here? Yeah, okay. So this is an activity called TRIS, uh, which is a liberating structure. Liberating structures are ways of, if you haven't used them before, ways of structuring conversations so everybody gets to participate. So when we're all in the main room, only a few people will talk, but in the breakout, you'll have a chance to speak. So if what we're trying to do, open education, usually you want to resist or address or you know solve a problem of social injustice. But with TRIS, you work backwards, you do the opposite, okay? So if you wanted to create an open education pro uh, project that reproduces oppression and inequity, so it will create more injustice, how would you do that? So I'm just going to give you like um, a few minutes in small groups to answer this question. I'm going to put it in the chat so it goes with you to the breakout room. So you want to do the opposite of what you really want to do. Okay, so any of you have questions before? So think about the worst things you can do, not the good things. Think about the bad things that we can do to make a project that's open but makes more injustice. And I am going to put you in groups of three or four to discuss this for about four minutes. Okay, hopefully this works out okay. If something goes wrong, you can always come back, like you don't find anybody in your room or something. Right. I always create rooms bigger than three just in case someone drops out. So hopefully it will be okay. Sorry to cut you off. <laughs> I know some of you were still talking. Sorry about that. Just time. We have 15 minutes left, so... Can you let me know in the chat some of the things you came up with? How would you promote injustice if you were doing it on purpose? <laughs> I'll I'll wait for the chat, but if you also want to unmute, it's also fine.
very costly price. So, I mean, open usually is free. So the tools themselves being high end and costly and exclusive. So not anybody could use them, right? Age group and target group. So some things can be focused on one target group, not another. Qualification, everyone who has an A. So not everybody. Language, exclusive use of English for sure. Not catering for all abilities, definitely. National holidays being not considered. Yes, setting very high expectations on people's tech. Yeah, I agree. So important to try to uh, create educational experiences where everybody is able to use them and not uh, only people who are very tech savvy, for sure. Dividing power to attend. Very interesting point. Yes. Okay, so the way um, the TRIZ works is when we bring out all the negative things that we don't want to do, we think about, do we actually do these things sometimes? So as I was reading some of what you're saying, I realized there's some things I do in my classes that expect students to know a little bit more technology and so not all of them have it. Um, but I do ask them to help each other. But yeah, could it be done simpler, for example? So what, what the TRIZ is supposed to do is bring out the worst thing and make you stop and think, do I do any of these things? Are people around me doing this? And then think about one thing you can change or stop doing to avoid reproducing injustice in these ways that we've just talked about. Can you make it not exclusively in one language? Can you make sure that you're dividing the power to attend? Not dividing it, obviously, making it accessible to everybody. How can we do those things? So I'm going to share with you um, a model that we had created related to um, thinking about social justice and open educational practices. So if you're going to do something, is it content-centric or process-centric? So is it like you're creating something that's about a content, you're creating a, a course or a book, or is it about a process where the learners are discovering something together and we're having conversations? Is it something that the teacher is doing or something that the learner is doing? So is it the teacher who's creating a book or the learners who are creating a book? And are we doing open education because it's just good learning or is are we doing it because it's good for social justice? And when we think about social justice, we're taking a look at several different dimensions. Economic is by making something free, but cultural is also by representing different cultures, kind of like what we said with Wikipedia, not all languages, not all uh, cultural groups, not all women are represented. And political justice by giving people the power to choose what to do. So, for example, until now, the people who had, I mean, the CEO maybe of Wikipedia is a woman, but generally speaking, most of the people who are editors are men. And so they still control what can get deleted from Wikipedia. They controlled what the criteria are for adding something to Wikipedia that made this woman who's a Nobel Prize winner not on it, right? And we can think about changes that we make. Are we making a change that helps solve the immediate problem? Or are we solving the systemic social injustice problem? So this is all based on Nancy Fraser's work, which you can read later if you're interested. But I want to say we need to always think about when we're doing something to infuse social justice throughout the purpose, the process, the people, and the product. So if we think it's about something like a Wikipedia, then maybe the purpose, first of all, make sure that you're trying to create Wikipedia material about people who are underrepresented. Make sure that everybody is trained on how to edit so that the process becomes equal for all of them. Make sure you involve students who are themselves minorities or, or women or people who are more marginalized, and then make sure that the product itself also represents uh, social justice in that way. I'm going to skip here. I meant to make these, uh, yeah. All right, and this is another quote that I love from Adrienne Marie Brown. She, she says, intentional adaptation is important in our processes. And she says, we need to do less prep, more presence. So focus less on preparing something so that it's perfect and try to be present with the people so that you can keep changing and being flexible if needed, like water, right? So one of the, the approaches that I've co-developed with my colleagues is called Intentionally Equitable Hospitality and has four phases to help you think through what you're doing and think about whether you're approaching social justice or not. And so the first thing is to pre-design before you even design. Who do you involve in the design? Whose work are you reading to influence you? Is there a funder? What are the impositions of the funder? How might those imposition privilege certain groups over others? And then when you're designing something, can you anticipate that there are certain inequalities that you might face, like students might have? Which kind of oppressions can you redress? Or is there anything about the way you're designing it that might reproduce inequality? What can you do about that? But then if you have space to facilitate something, how can you keep intentionally adapting 
to new inequalities that arise in the moment with what pre apartheid calls generous authority, which means using your authority as a facilitator to help those whose voice is not heard to be heard. And then beyond the moment, how do you build an inclusive and equitable community in a sustainable way? And that's a lot of, I guess, what ONL is for you all, right? It's a space you can build community over time. Um, and it's designed, hopefully, meant to be accessible to all of you. All right. I want to ask something, because I haven't defined open education by listing the different kinds of things that constitute open education. And I'm curious if you kind of feel like you still have questions about what open education is or about social justice and open education before I move on. Because the last activity is the activity with paper that I want you to do reflections. But I'm curious if you have questions or something is unclear. So about open education or about social justice. Okay. I'm going to do one activity, but make sure you have a piece of paper for the last activity. I'm going to do one activity first before we do the reflection. Um, okay, here we go. So this was an umbrella that was they were giving out at one of the open education conferences, and it says, useful only if open. Um, but I want us to challenge that this like in goodness openness isn't always good when can an umbrella be useful if it's closed and when can opening it be harmful so i want us to always think that even if someone says that they're intending to do something good that it isn't sometimes technology companies especially they say they're doing something for our own good but it isn't and we need to be very critical of that but also sometimes even something that is usually good might not always be good so can an umbrella be useful when it's closed? What would that be like? Yes, we can use it to walk. Can an umbrella, anything else? Getting away attacking birds. Oh my God, where are these attacking birds? But yeah. <laughs> Use it to get items off of high shelf in the supermarket. I love that. Use the hook. Nice. I like that a lot. Also stuff under the couch, right? Sometimes <laughs> a pointing device. Yes, sure. If one is not strong enough to hold it up. Yeah, definitely. All right. Can an umbrella be harmful when it's opened or closed even? Like, can an umbrella be a harmful thing? Has anyone ever opened an umbrella in your face? No? <laughs> it can be used to attack someone. In closed spaces, yeah. It can prevent seeing, yeah. Even when you're using it because it's raining or whatever, it can prevent seeing. It's true. Okay, you can get swept away in a storm. <laughs> like Mary Pump. You have to be very light, though, I think, for that to happen. But yes, thanks for sharing that. Okay, we're going to... When someone close to you, you don't see them and they open the umbrella. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm going to get a piece of paper now that we're going to use. So if you have a piece of paper, if you can't get it out of the notebook or whatever, it's okay. You can keep it there. But if you can have a piece of paper, we're going to do a reflective activity. You can hurt someone accidentally when you're walking in the rain. Yeah, for sure. All right. Piece of paper. Oops. And I'm going to fold it in two like this. So if you can do the same with me, fold the spiral journal, actually, and then open it and then fold it the other way. So you end up with something with four quadrants, you see, like four over like this. Or you can just draw two lines, that works too. I just like the folding process, it feels good. When you're online and you're not, yeah, perfect. What Susanna's doing. <laughs> All right, and I am going to play some music. And while I'm playing the music, 
I want you to draw a spiral continuously. So this is what a spiral is. This is a spiral in the middle over here, but you don't want to fill up the entire thing, right? You want to just, I'll show you very quickly, but like keep going like this for a minute. Oh, can you see it? You can't see it, but you know what a spiral is, right? Just keep going, moving your hand like this, but only in the middle. Okay, I'll play some music for you. And then we're going to use every quarter of the page to answer a different question. So I'm just going to ask the question and you write it down for yourself on the paper. So the first quadrant is right now I feel. Then the second part is I joined this session in order to. One thing I will do differently after this is and finally for the fourth fourth part I still need help with okay so this spiral journal is for your own reflection. But if you're willing to share your answer to one of those things, please do that in the chat. Are you willing to share one, one of your answers? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, so right now I feel inspired. Uh, the other question, uh, I, I don't remember the question, but uh, is to know more about teaching and learning. Um, and the, the <laughs> try to involve students. That's uh, what I'm going to try to do. And I need help to develop uh, an open uh, education tool. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for sharing, Susanna. So if anybody else would like to share orally or in the chat, that's fine. Or if you just want to share with me, like you can either share what you wrote in the spiral journal or tell me something you're going to take away from today in the chat or orally or whatever. We have a couple minutes. Joanna is saying she'll use tips on activities shown today, right? Good to know. Susanna about open education promoting social justice. Worth investigating more the possibilities of open learning. Hopefully you'll do this for the rest of the week or two weeks where you're discussing this topic, inshallah. Yeah. Hopefully from now on uh, indefinitely. Yeah. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> Open access can integrate people, such as why I can speak stuff here. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, everybody, so much. Um, I'm going to share my email and Twitter with you in case anybody wants to get in touch. I'll put the slides again in the chat. 
Thank you so much. Ah, Cass shared all her spiral journal. Intrigued and thoughtful, joined to expand thinking, utilize new perspectives and be more intentional, right? And help with refining and focusing, moving into action, spending less time being perfect. Oh, everybody needs help with that, Kath. <laughs> it's a... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, perfect is the opposite, is the enemy of done, I think, a lot of times, yeah. All right, thank you, everybody. I have to go to my next meeting. Yeah. I hope you have a good rest of your thank day. You. Thank you so much for joining us and holding this Get session. Get well soon, Jörg. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. See you all. I love you. Bye. 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 Bye.